Okay. Um, I'm going to kick off um, a very uh, warm good afternoon to everybody. Uh, this is our webinar around unlocking the food commons and um, trying to think through what this means uh, in practice. Um, there have been various uh, initiatives on the ground across South Africa before COVID-19 uh, to ensure sort of localized grassroots provisioning of food. We are in a context in which at least 30 million people are food stressed at the moment in the country. Uh, the government is not rising to the challenge. Uh, the Minister of Social Development has publicly declared she's only distributed 58,000 food parcels. This translates into about 232,000 people being impacted by this. It's too little, it's too slow. We're also not seeing a partnership with the Solidarity Fund and grassroots community organizations and civil society initiatives that are at the front line. This is also hampering efforts to meet people's food needs. We are also uh, not seeing, if you like, supermarkets play their part in terms of ensuring food prices for essentials don't go up. We're actually seeing price creep at the moment, uh, particularly of essentials. We are also not seeing uh, supermarkets promote solidarity buying and people's pantries. And as a result, um, they, they, they are not playing the part they should be playing, although they are making lots of profits at the moment. But um, despite all of those problems, um, and maybe because of those problems rather, we are seeing major hunger flashpoints. And I think we've got to characterize these things appropriately. We are seeing uh, uh, hunger riots. Uh, we are seeing attempts uh, out of desperation um, to kind of capture food. Uh, you've seen the hijacking of a bakery truck in the country. I think in KZN, you've seen the hijacking of a meat truck in Philippi. Uh, so there's a lot of desperation. There's been a three kilometer line of people standing up to get food parcels in Centurion uh, that has been reported in the media. We've seen violence break out in Boysons, in, 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 in Johannesburg, uh, around food parcels. And so there's a lot of stress right now in society around people's food needs, a lot of desperation. So keeping that in mind, um, we, 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 we have to start thinking about what can, what can plug the gap uh, at the moment. And our perspective, uh, particularly from the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center, is that the food commons is very, very important in South Africa. Thousands of people around our coastal cities in this country fish. And they fish uh, to feed their families and they fish to also generate an income. They've been locked down uh, at, the, at level five and it's not clear where they are on level four. We also have um, 180,000 small scale farmers. This is not the 4,000 farmers that really control agro-industrial food production in this country, but 180,000 small scale farmers that also produce across the country and they are very crucial for food supply to informal traders. And again, it's very patchy in terms of amount, the rights they have to come on stream to continue producing as well. We also have community gardeners, we and thousands of them across the country in food hotspots. We have micro farmers working on, um, on, on probably 40 square meters or less of land and all of these hotspots and food practices are very, very important in the everyday lives of people in South Africa. In the informal sector, which is very, very important, three million people provide a bridge uh, into, into, um, into food economies for people. In township communities, in poor communities, 70% of people buy from informal traders. But again, under level five restrictions, that was locked down under level four, again, it's not clear whether the food commons is going to be opened. And we believe the food commons is a big part of the food system in South Africa. And it's something that is, that is clearly missing and it's clearly contributing to the food crisis currently. It's also necessary for the next food system we have to build. Now to help us explore these issues, we have a great panel. Unfortunately, Des Desai is having some technical problems. 
but I'm hoping he's going to join us. Uh, we have Makhta Campbell. Uh, Makhta's uh, a teacher at Beacon Primary School in Mitchell's Plain. Makhta has been uh, busy for many, many years in her community, in her school, with her garden, and she's just done amazing work around building a food sovereignty pathway, and she's touched many lives, and she's going to share that experience with us. We have John and Zira. John has been an agroecologist for many, many years. Uh, John works with over 2,000 small-scale farmers in the Limpopo area, training them in agroecology and building food sovereignty pathways. They have developed very important concepts for their work and, and capacities for their work. And he's going to give us insights into, into his work. John has also been training us at Wits University, which is one of the food sovereignty pathways in the country that we're also piloting. And to lead us and give us insight on that is Jane Cherry from the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center. Uh, Jane is a leading activist in the campaign, in the food sovereignty campaign, and has been holding it all together at WITS. And she's going to share with us that exciting pathway. Um, we still don't have Des on board, but just to introduce him, and hopefully when he does come in, uh, we'll just, just stream, in, in, stream him in. Uh, Des has been a longstanding environmental and climate justice activist in South Africa. Uh, he's been fighting um, refineries in the Durban area for many years. He's been, been, been defending the rights of small-scale producers in, in and around Durban. He works very, very closely with small-scale subsistence fishers, over 10,000 of them. He's also won an award for his work, uh, an internationally recognized award. So, De so Des is very, very important uh, for our conversation. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Magda Campbell. Uh, Magda, please, please um, present on your experience. So you have about 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you, Vish. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm okay. Good day, comrades. It's good to be connected again. And today I'm Marta Campbell. I am the founder of Beacon Organic Garden, situated in Mitchell's Plain. Yes, with this COVID-19, it had a huge impact on us, where we did not expect this to happen as immediately, although we were aware of the coronavirus that was out there, but didn't expect it to happen within days. So what happened, we had a great loss of because, because we are situated at the school and we work with special needs school uh, children, we, the principal decided that we had to sh shut down immediately um, because of the safety of our learners at school. And at that time, we had a garden full of food in our, in, and there was no way we had to close down and everything was locked and food went wasted. We were not even allowed to enter our school premises without a permit. And it took us two weeks to get the permit out. And we had um, our market in Tumzi, community farmers, that is our market. We had to collaborate with them and they helped us to get permits. And also while we were trying with the first two weeks, they also um, helped us to get some funding from our customers, which was a great help we also had to put things in place. But if I should come back to um, our community, there was food available and the community had no access to the food, which was very sad because we were not allowed to go to so that we can feed our people. So after two weeks when we had access, we could at least go in and, but wait most of the things, because there was no water, there was nothing and most of our vegetables, you know, deteriorated and, and, and that was to us a great loss. So now what we say now, we, we now that the lockdown, um, we're on stage four now and we have access and we have all our um, prevention equipment. So we have access to our, our communities, um, our gardens. But what I can say is that within the, in the Mitchell's Plain area alone, there are so many people that went without food and there was a struggle because you know of the violence within the community especially those that were desperate they used to um, protest 
because there was no food. There was some delay with the food parcels in the beginning. Things was finally operating now where people have access. We had to join up with NGOs um, that can help us buy our veggies from us that we could save. And then that we also invest that into the communities. So that is there at least there is some um, breather where we can say that we might have lost, but we're also starting now, you know, to generate again money to sustain our garden, should everything is back to normal. But now in, in the Mitchell's Plain area, if I can just go back on the missionary, uh, as of last week, Wednesday, um, the latest statistic was that we have 115 people that are that was tested positive in Mitchell's Plain. And even um, from our malls, um, prominent malls was on um, shutdown because there was also people tested positive, including one of our police stations. So, but overall, what we have that most of the people adhere to the regulations, but there are instances where individuals contravene the regulation in certain areas, which is a problem within our community. Um, and what we're trying to do now is now, now that the people have food. Um, at least we have one step ahead, but the um, unemployment rate has increased in tremendously. We have so many people that work for small um, organizations that cannot afford to keep the people on. And therefore, we, we had a, a, um, lots of people that was unemployed prior to the um, pandemic. But things has increased tremendously now. And I think in the future, that's going to become a major problem because where are the people going to find work? Um, the small companies cannot afford because even they sit with a problem there where they also did not generate money over the past um, while this um, shutdown was in process. So what we do now in the meantime, we are back at the, the farms now where we um, start to grow vegetable again. We co co collaborate with other farmers across the Western Cape and, not, and across the Cape Flats in Cape Town. And we um, decided now that we're all going to work together and see how we can um, take this movement forward. And the beauty of this all is to see that how the communities is actually getting to, together now. People are starting to move in, in the same direction. We, we all realize we all um, are going through this situation together and that we need each other now. So which I'm grateful for is that we, um, like NGOs, Food Lovers Markets, and the Khaleesi Foundation, they are assisting the feeding schemes now with Mitchell's Green Area, as well as the city who are committed to work with national and provisional government to ensure that the residents have food on their tables. In action in the city, committing councillors are even now playing their part, making sure that they contribute and they support the different communities within that area. So that is something positive that is happening in our community. I don't have, don't have the latest statistics as to where we stand with the infection now, but for now, that is where we are now. We are also looking at now how we can um, create jobs within the community where we are starting to make masks and, you know, help with the prevention and soup kitchens are, there are so many soup kitchens that are everybody's on board and we work together as a unit which we are very grateful for so my only concern is now especially with the gardens at the schools we don't know when those people will have access to go back so that is one of our problems that we are concerned about uh, for now I can't hear you, Vish. I can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry, Marcia. Before I move on, um, do you want to just give a little bit more detail about your garden and the links you made with households and stuff over time before COVID-19? Just a little yeah. bit of um, information. I started um, Beacon Garden in 2015. 
And the reason why I started was to create a platform for um, learners with special needs because I am situated at an Alston school. And um, when I was busy working with the workers, parents um, was very impressed with the progress of their children. And they started to, to come to me and were interested in also to start their own gardening. And I thought, you know what? with me working with the special needs children and creating a platform for them, I then decided if I can register the business and employ some of the ex-learners of Beacon School and create jobs for them, which will be a plus for them. And out of the three that I employed, they all permanent working for the government at schools now, uh, and they all started their own gardens. And with me being on one of the main roads, the community were very interested to see what was going on because this garden was growing and they thought it was just a, a, a school project. But when I joined up with Soul for Life, they worked with community because, you know, I could not handle, one person could not handle um, the entire Mitchell's plane. And we decided to come up with a home gardening project whereby so for life they have the resources they have the funding which i never had and i decided to to become partners with them so that they can i can make use of their trainers to support me to help people to set up home gardeners within the mitchell spring area because it's so sad to see that people go hunger people are dependent on the success you know the government um, support that they get but that is a once-off income that they have. And I believe that when people have their own food garden, then they have food on a daily basis. And we were working towards zero hunger within our communities. And we have, we have four um, sections where, per year where we would take groups on and we would spend three months with them, you know, help them grow educate them. I also started a resource center where people can come in at any time to the garden and they can come ask or volunteer to see how they, where they can improve their garden. And what we also did out of that, I managed to, to, call a, um, to work with other farmers from other communities. And um, we also create this market, which is from Tumzi Community Farmers. It's a market that we as um, farmers, small scale farmers, um, started on our own because that was a common problem whereby our people, our farmers had no access to markets. And we have grown tremendously over the past three years, um, started our own garden. And now the beauty of this all is where the communities, even if we have just three bunches of carrots or whatever you have, available we would take that and also generate the income for our people so currently the mitchell's plain area and including the cape flats because i'm working now with different um communities not just mitchell's plain where we all decided that we're going to work together and start making things because you know one thing i've learned since i started working with safc is that we need to push from bottom up and that is what we were doing because we wanted people to acknowledge um, the work that we do. And for now, that the contacts that people, the contacts that, that's been people have made with me is that people starting to acknowledge, we getting recognitions. We started our farmers have now over almost a thousand um, customers, which where we drop off vegetable boxes on a weekly basis which means um, there is some um, positive movement from pushing up. So now, as I think after, I, I trust and I believe that after this, we will have even more acknowledgement where the government is concerned. So yeah, I can just thumbs up for, for the people. You know, when I started, I was alone. There was times when I thought I was going nowhere. But today I can see that it really paid off all the hard work like now when you when you lead the farmers they are there they are eager to do anything because they can see that we we are making a difference within our lives we are not just dependent on government but we becoming financially and stable we're not where we what would love to be but we are on our way so that and I'm, i feel now doing it together as a unit 
we can compete with the, with the corporate guys now. Thank you, Magda. I mean, this is the point. I mean, you, you've been building a food system in your community, impacting households, uh, impacting the community in general. And that's, that's the story and lesson we have to learn from you as well. Thank you for highlighting that. John, over to you and your work in the rural areas and, and building pathways. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Um, yeah, thank you for connecting us. Uh, and uh, this is very important for all of us. Uh, I'm from Ukuvuna. Uh, Ukuvuna is working in Limpopo. Uh, whilst working in Limpopo, we have uh, target areas or districts. We are working in Skukuni district and we are working in uh, Capricorn district and the Vembe district and Waterbeck district. Of recent, we are going to work uh, in uh, Mopane district. But uh, how we are operating there in the Mopane in all these districts, we are taking opportunities that are already there and also considering the challenges that we are coming across. For example, with the COVID, uh, COVID-19. We have this challenge uh, of COVID-19 where people are not able to get food locally. But with the programs we have, the farmers are able to get uh, food locally. And uh, we are also saying with this COVID-19, it has also some opportunities that, are, uh, that we are coming across because the opportunities are, it is driving us to grow our own food. And this is the answer to be sustainable in our communities, or even if you're looking at a broader scale, looking at a country. It is important that most of the food should come within South Africa to feed our South African people. So to present my, uh, my talk, I'm going to share with you the diagram that shows how we operate in this district. So the, where is it? I lost, I lost my, my, my diagram. <coughs> yeah, oh, sorry. This is, okay, this is uh, my, the diagram that we are working on. Um, if you look at uh, the bottom here, we have what we call the core, the CO, COE, which is the center of excellence and also the nodes. In every community, you find that there is a, a farmer or some farmers who are already practicing farming and they've learned this from their traditional systems or from their fathers, from their ancestors, they continue farming. We go to them and learn from them. And uh, after learning from them, we say we agree for them to share the knowledge to other farmers. And when they share the knowledge to other farmers, then we sorry, think John, sorry, sorry, John, sorry, just trouble you. I don't think we've been able to see your diagram. Um, so I don't know if share screen is working on your end. Um, you press oh, share okay. screen. I press share screen. Let me yeah. go back. And then. Yeah, I'm going to share, I share. Then, or oh, I pick my diagram like this. Yeah. Yeah, it should be coming online. Yay, thank you. Yes, okay. you can see it. Thank you, thank you. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, <clears throat> so looking at the bottom, like here, yeah, this is our diagram, how we operate. And uh, right at the bottom, you see, we have the, uh, what you call COE, and the, the COE, uh, the centers of excellence are the communities or the farmers or households who are practicing already their uh, farming activities. And you look there, we call them also sometimes the nodes. And this is a, where we say from the farmers themselves, they learn from others and only when there is something that they can show to others. So we encourage this farmer who is practicing already to teach others. And when he teach others, then some will be able to understand 
the concept of like necessary or plant production or vegetable production or uh, water harvesting and then they form what we call a COP or a cluster system where those who are talking the same language in terms of water harvesting or growing vegetables or growing herbs or growing they, group, they are grouped together to expand the knowledge to others and in a in a COP they share different ideas of how they can expand the program and when this uh, community uh, when these clusters are established then we we develop what we call a hub a hub it's a learning uh, center where they share knowledge where farmers they share knowledge and they share the techniques different techniques that helps them to take care of the environment to produce their own food to create business and to network with others and also to lobby the government and to create a movement from on based on what they want to see in their own own communities so currently the hub we have uh, attempted ourselves to set a hub in hamakuya uh, in vembe district uh, where we approached the school that is in the locality and we agreed with the school to set a hub where uh, the communities they come and set a demonstration of how to grow plants how to do business how to do crafts how to keep traditional seeds how to so with that hub they learn and then they expand they take the knowledge back into the community and expand this hub allows other districts to come in the area and also the farmers in the area they are also having access to go to other districts or to other communities who are not able to grow their own food so in hamakuya we have one demonstration of a hub and also in the uh, skukuni at mutetema we have also a, a, a hub that we have established and at skukuni the hub is at, uh, at a clinic a mutetema clinic so it's the government infrastructure we are making use of the space that is available the communities that are participating in the program they are benefiting by learning and sharing and also uh, creating business and selling the product that they produce at the center and uh, at the end of the day they are distributing or sharing the knowledge to other communities so that they influence every household to grow their own food um, we are looking at the other other province to set similar hubs but we haven't started establishing those hubs in other in other districts but looking at what we have done on the ground we have over 2000 uh, farmers who are following uh, the systems that we are practicing in the community the main purpose the main idea is to make the people change create a system that they change themselves and when they change themselves they have a voice they have a right they know their rights of saying this is the type of food that we need in our community and this is the type of seed we need in our community this is the system we need in our community so the voice if it's coming from the farmer is themselves it helps a change with a bigger picture and that's why i say uh, covid 19 it is an opportunity because it is also strengthening these farmers to say ah now there are no food from external there is no food from outside how can we sustain ourselves so with the gardens that we have established the farmers now are sustaining themselves and they are seeing the importance of growing their own food in their own community and we with this process we are encouraging those people who are doing excellent work to be the teachers of their own community and the teachers of other districts but mainly looking at uh, their strengths some are, of their strengths are based on nurseries some of their strengths are based on keeping indigenous seeds some of uh, good in water harvesting water conservation so we build those knowledge and th those strengths to make sure that we have uh, teachers or uh, we have uh, educators in a community who can teach there are other people with their own within their own community and with their with their own language 
without bringing externals to develop the, themselves. So basically, that's what we are doing in Limpopo. Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, Sorry, thank you, John. This is an example yeah. of a concrete uh, practice of advancing uh, a food sovereignty pathway in a rural community. Mm -hmm. And Martha gave us a, a glimpse into what she's been doing in an urban setting. Now over to Jane uh, Cherry. Thanks, Vish. Um, my, connect, my internet connection is a little bit unstable, so please interrupt me if you can't hear anything. I'm also going to share my, scre my screen because I've got a PowerPoint. Um, see if this works. Okay. All Are right. You can you see it? Yeah. Can you put it in full screen mode? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Can you put it into full screen mode? The slides. It is. Um, yeah. Now it's full screen. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll try. I'll try share it again. It is full screen for me. Let me try. No, no, again. we can see it. We can um, full screen. It's perfect. Oh, it's perfect. Okay. Okay, now I can't see it. <laughs> you can see it. And can you see the next slide now? No, 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 we can't see it. It's disappeared. Okay, I need to, I think, yeah, I need to redo that. Just a moment. The connection is not that um, great. Sorry about this. Um, Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so as Vish mentioned, I'm going to share details of the Food Sovereignty Center pathway building experience. Um, but I'm going to start off with a brief explanation Jane, your connection's really bad. You're kind of echoing and dragging. Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Maybe when you lean into something or something. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Hello? Okay. Let me let me try again. You're clear Hello? now. You're clear. You're clear. Go for it. Go for it. Hi, I'm still here. Okay, go um, for it. Okay, let me go. Um, so I'm going to share details of, okay, of the Wits Food Sovereignty Center pathway building experience, but I'm going to start with a brief explanation and history of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, um, because this is where the story begins and partly what inspired the Wits pathway. So the idea for the Food Sovereignty Campaign arose in 2014, after COPAC, together with the Foundation for Human Rights, hosted right to food dialogues across the country. And the key outcome from these dialogues was the need to create a national campaign for food sovereignty. One that would ensure that food sovereignty is placed on the national agenda and is an alternative way forward for our food system. So in March, 2015, the SAFSI was launched as a campaign and it was made up of organizations representing small scale farmers, NGOs, community organizations, cooperatives, waste pickers, the unemployed students, and the hungry, to name a few. And since its launch, SAFSI has hosted a number of national and local level activities, including a hunger, hunger tribunal in 2015, a drought speak out on a national bread march. And then in 2016, SAFSI launched the People's Food Sovereignty Act at a food sovereignty festival and a people's parliament, and has had many engagements with the act since then. It was after 2017 that this, after the 2017 SAFSI assembly that the orientation of the campaign began to shift. 
And here it was decided that instead of focusing on national interventions, energy would shift towards local level food sovereignty pathway building. So there were still some national level interventions like dialogues on the drought in 2018, the climate justice charter process during 2019 and 2020. Um, but essentially since 2018, SACSI partners have been in a process to build food sovereignty in villages, towns, and cities. So here's just a few pictures of some of the campaigning that we've done. The first picture is the assembly. Next we have the, that was the tribunal, some activist schools on agroecology, and then the bottom pictures are the hunger march, which ended up at WITS, which I'll touch on later. Can everyone still hear me and see my slides? Yeah. Okay, yes. good. All right, so building food sovereignty in villages, towns, and cities. This means that we are building, exist, building on existing pathways that partners in the SACI has established um, in their communities or sites, and that we are strengthen, strengthening them and initiating new pathways. Some examples include Magda's and John's excellent examples, um, but there's also more across the country in Eastern Cape, in the West Coast, in Limpopo, um, where people are building food sovereignty working with the communities, fighting against mining, um, practicing agroecology, doing training, etc. And COPAC, together with input from other SASI partners, have contributed a number of tools to assist communities as they build pathways. And these are activist tools that can be workshopped in communities, and they cover a range of topics like food sovereignty, worker cooperatives, seed saving, water sovereignty, land justice, and climate justice. And all of these are available for download on the SACSI website. And at our national events, we have handed out um, all, a lot of these documents to the activists. Can you still hear me? Yes. Fine. Okay, good. I, I got a notification that my network is unstable, but I'll keep going. Okay, so it was partly because of this shift um, in the SAFC to start focusing on building food sovereignty locally that COPAC, a SAFC partner, decided to focus on this. COPAC is based in Johannesburg and our board, board chairperson, this is an associate professor at WITS. And as we had been continually engaging with students and vol as volunteers in the SAFC, we decided to scale up our involvement and entered into a memorandum of agreement with WITS to establish the Food Sovereignty Center. So what is the vision of the center? The vision of the center is to create a university that is eco-centered and provides leadership through its own example to advance food sovereignty and climate justice. And as a hub and pathway, it then becomes an example for more hubs in the inner city through which an inner city alliance and pathway can be advanced. The, the idea is that these hubs serve to network households, small scale producers, seed savers, water commoning initiatives, consumer markets, and cultural nutrition programs related to indigenous food. Okay, so that's the vision, but how do we get there and what steps have we taken so far? I'll start off again with some more background, this time background on the center. So it's been a lengthy process. Um, it started off back in 2015 when a student forum was established at WITS, later called the Inala Forum for Food Sovereignty and Climate Justice. This was actually inspired by Vicious International Relations class and later gathered members from across different faculties. And then in 2015, the students, and I was one of them, set up their first food garden on campus. During 2016, together with SAFSI, Inala took part in the National Bread March and handed over a memorandum to WITS, which laid out how the university could become more environmentally, more food sovereign and climate just. And here are these photos again. Um, the one on the right is us handing over the the memorandum to WITS management. Um, after discussions with WITS management, the sanctuary building, and I'll show you pictures of that later, was allocated to the WCCO, which is the WITS Citizenship and Community Outreach, for the existing university funded meal bank and the donor sponsored food bank, and the soon to be established food sovereignty center. Before this, I should just mention the meal bank was located below the matrix, which is the fast food complex at WITS. Um, and the students would line up in a loading bay, surrounded by trucks and exhaust fumes to receive their hot meals or their meal packs. And so the sanctuary building now provides a much more dignified space for food stressed students to receive food parcels 
and to eat their meals and also cook their own meals if they want to. And then in 2018, COPAC entered into a memorandum of agreement with WITS to set up the center, the site that can be the hub to serve as an example to other big institutions, that it is possible to practice the alternatives outlined in the vision. COPAC and WCCO have been working together with different student groups to strategize and implement the food sovereignty vision. And these student groups include Amnesty International, the WITS group, um, Engineers Without Borders, WITS, UNICEF has recently approached us, and then the INALA student group and the WITS Physics Council, WITS Student Physics Council. All right, so the objectives. The objectives of the center are to end hunger at WITS through the Food Sovereignty Pathway, to create a zero carbon and zero waste university, and to use this model and elements as the basis to reach the goal, which is ending hunger in the inner city of Johannesburg. So how do we do this? There are a number of elements that we have set up at the center and across the university. There are some that we still intend to set up, um, but this all takes time, especially at a university. If anyone's worked at a university, at a university you would know this. Um, I've listed the internal and external elements here on the slide for you to look at. And in this picture, number one is the existing food sovereignty center. Everything around it doesn't yet exist except for the market space that exists once a month. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through each of these elements individually um, with some pictures. So first, land, water, um, composting and food gardens. This is about setting up food commons gardens across the university, maintaining the gardens, harvesting water or using water wisely in the gardens, developing a zero waste approach and offer training to the best staff, students and the greater community in these elements. There are currently four food gardens at WITS, and we have mapped out space for another 17 gardens. These gardens are maintained by students, and we're also trying to get them institutionalized so that the WITS ground staff also take care of these. The gardens supply fresh produce to any student who needs any staff member, ground staff member, and the communal kitchen. And here are just some images, some more images. The one on the right is John giving a an agroecology and permaculture class with some cabbages on the left, some more pictures of the gardens, some weeding, and then on the left there's some students and Courtney from Copac are harvesting herb garden, and then on the right students have started saving seeds because we also intend to set up a seed bank. The second element is communal kitchens and a dignity space for students, and this is about providing a space of dignity for food stress students, a space where they can cook their own meals, learn about food, nutrition, indigenous food and culture. And with funding from the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, we were able to equip the existing kitchen in the sanctuary with an oven, a stove, a fridge, a freezer, pots, cutlery and crockery. And students have been self-organizing, facilitated by Amnesty International Wits, and they've been using donations and also food produce from the gardens to cook meals for themselves in the evenings. Currently, there's only space and budget for 10 students to cook 20 meals per day. So they cook for themselves and they cook for 10 other people. Um, but we are raising more funds for more food and also for more space so for a modular kitchen on the site. We've also invited chefs, and this has been quite exciting, um, celebrity chefs to provide cooking classes and the students have really enjoyed learning how to cook from experts. The third element is food culture programs. This is the sanctuary building. Um, this is about setting up a program on food, indigenous knowledge recipes, to include talks on food politics, host film screenings, poetry, music, cook-ins. Ideally, these should be organized by the students. Um, we've only hosted a few isolated events, but we want this to become a weekly feature. And as you can see in this picture, this mural contributes to the cultural element. Last year, we invited a Bolivian muralist, Norke Lee, to paint the sanctuary. She incorporated indigenous foods, African culture, and, and vibrant colors, converting the very boring white building into a more inviting and cultural space. Another element is eco-demonstration. So the center will be a symbolic space to demonstrate zero carbon, zero waste, and zero hunger practices and technologies so that other departments, schools, and faculties will follow suit. And we're in the process of securing solar for the site, 
and we have set up water harvesting at one of the gardens so far. We're also working, working with the university to look at how they're managing their waste. So it's all happening slowly. Another element is the Food Sovereignty Consumer Co-op or a market. Long term, we do hope to set up a cooperative with different members, um, but for now we provide a platform for local farmers to self-organize and to sell their produce at a monthly market to the staff and students and other community members. And they sell organic products at very reasonable prices at this market. And then there's a few elements that are still in the pipeline, such as the Food Sovereignty Research Center. This is a longer term goal. There's no department in BITS that deals directly with food sovereignty. And so the research center will fill that gap and provide space for research in the science of agroecology, food systems, also indigenous knowledge and food culture. And also it will serve as a space to offer training and workshops in food sovereignty related topics. And then there's also external elements. So Farmer Networks and the Inner City Alliance. We have been building up a contact list and this includes farmers in the market. And we have potential, potential sites for additional inner city agroecology hubs. But these are still in the planning stages. And then along came COVID-19. So you're probably wondering, and yes, the COVID-19 crisis has interrupted all of this. Um, we haven't been able to access the gardens or the site since the university is closed. Um, so we don't really know what's happening at the gardens. A bit like Magda, we don't know what's happening at the gardens. There's no one cooking in the kitchens. There's probably weeds popping up, but John will tell you they're edible, most of them probably. Um, and so as soon as the university does, as soon as we allow it back at the university, we'll get back into the garden to weed, um, but also to strengthen this pathway, keeping in mind social distancing practices and health guidelines. And just to note to this end, we've worked with ACB on a pamphlet for growing food in the context of 2019. And this is it, it's not yet final. Um, we're still getting feedback on it, but you can take a quick look at it. We're also getting it translated. So keep your eye on our social media pages for this pamphlet in the near future. And then just to end, um, just to say we can't guarantee that there'll be no more COVID-19 or similar to similar interruptions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, but we can guarantee that hunger will persist. And sites like these spread across the country will provide important pathways for supplying nutritious, culturally appropriate um, food to communities in need. And we're hoping that this VITS pathway um, will show what is possible in communities and big institutions and how we, we as communities can respond to the crises without the dependence on co the corporate food regime. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Um, so I don't know if Des has been able to link in. Do you, does any of you know? Jane, do you know if Des has been able to link in with us? Okay, well, that's unfortunate because Des uh, works with about 10,000 subsistence fishers in uh, Durban. Uh, they've also built a movement and it would have been great to hear his perspective on how subsistence farmers are struggling with lockdown rules and, and the lockdown of the commons. We have the, we've had this, the, um, we, have a, we are having the sardine run soon and that's a big source of food for people. Uh, in the Western Cape area, there's been the snook run and the minister did allow small scale fishers to engage in fishing around the snook run. But again, it's, 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 it's all very patchy and so on. So we now want to open this up to a conversation. What, what we've shared with you is examples of pathway building in community spaces, in local spaces. Uh, Magda has been building from her school and from her school has built a whole network of associates um, impacting on household food production, uh, impacting on other farmers. They've built their own community market. Uh, John has been working with over 2000 local um, community pr producers in villages in rural Limpopo. Uh, they've been innovating on the hub concept. And that's, that's actually a knowledge commons and it's sharing resources 
and skills, etc., between farmers, uh, so that farmers are at the center of what's happening. And Jane has shared the example of the Witz food sovereignty pathway. Uh, and that includes other elements like a communal kitchen, which is very, very important. Makhta mentioned local soup kitchens proliferating, etc. cetera. Um, so, so all of these are elements of, of food sovereignty pathways. So I'm going to open it up to comment and engagement. Uh, but before I get there, um, I think it was Anita. Anita asked about, is it 30 million people? Well, this is how we came to this estimate. There's about 18 million people on social grants in South Africa. Even if you take the highest grant uh, of, say, a, a disability recipient or an old age grant recipient, you're looking at about 1,870. If you add in even the top up from the, from the government that's coming for the next six months, that takes you to just over 2,000, say 2,300. The current value of a basket of essential goods in South Africa, this has been tracked by a Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice, Justice Institution, is about 3,400 right now. And food prices have been going up. Um, so immediately you've got about 18 million people who don't have the capacity to, to feed fully a family of four. And so people in the, in the informal sector in South Africa, one million of those being domestic workers. And of course, you also have lots of traders, uh, car guards, people who wash cars, reclaimers, almost 100,000 of them, etc., also having difficulties uh, keeping their livelihoods alive. And then in terms of unemployment, it's clear that unemployment is skyrocketing. So even if you use the narrow definition of unemployment, uh, about 5.6 million people, um, and you add on, we're expecting at least three to four more million people unemployed in South Africa. We'll end up with about 30 million, roughly as an estimate. So we, we, we beyond uh, a month of lockdown now, and there's a lot of food stress that's kicking in, and, and that's what we're seeing manifesting. And there isn't a requisite response coming from government to meet this need. So, so that's one possible response to that. Um, so Jacobus Nell has posed an issue around teachers and networking. Um, Jacobus wants to work, uh, is in Port Nollet and would like to set up a garden. Makhta, I don't know if you have any ad advice uh, to, to Jacobus around this. Okay, the garden that he would like to set up, is it a home garden or is it, um, does he have land? Um, he, he basically says he wants to start own garden. We'd like to collaborate with people who already have systems in place. Yeah. So I think it sounds like a home garden. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if um, I think that is the way all South Africans should go. And I think um, we realize now that how important it is to grow your own food because you know where your food come from and you know exactly what you're eating. When you buy anything from the store, you don't really know um, how nutritious the stuff is that you buy. But for, in order for him to set up a, a garden, and I think it's, it, it's very essential for people to, to decide on what is it that they want to grow, because there's no use starting a garden and you grow things that you cannot use in your kitchen. So if you can identify, there are certain things that are seasonal, but most of the vegetables, um, like your cabbage, your beetroot, those common vegetables, that is things that can grow right through the year. So he must now um, sit still and decide what is it that they need in his kitchen and then work on that. If you go on the website, um, you can Google it, where um, he can find what vegetables to grow. He can go to any nursery and see what the, what these uh, um, vegetables he can grow during what time of the year. So Edwin Eng Eng Engelis asks, there are several open spaces or comments in observatory which are suitable for growing vegetables, especially for the homeless here. Is there any who offers training in setting up veggie gardens anywhere to get seeds for such gardens and so on. John, I mean, maybe you should come in here to talk about how you've done training and how you've shared knowledge amongst the villages you work with in Limpopo and so on. And what is agroecology and why it's so important? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like to start uh, 
on the first question where Magda responded. The entry point for starting a project or a garden is to make sure that you do a proper assessment to check how much water do you have at your, uh, your household or at a school. And if you do not have tap water, how can you harvest water from the roof into container so that you can start a garden? And you need to check the soil, test the soil, what type of soil are you, gonna, are you going to, uh, to use for growing what type of crops? So there is a lot of assessment that one has to do before you start a garden. And also you need to make a connect connections of other people whom you know who have already started gardens, who are in the area and make a network out, that, out of that. Then you can start a good uh, project of garden. Um, how to start a garden, especially in open areas, people have to start organize themselves first, like if it's an urban area, uh, you need to identify uh, one or two people who are already doing gardening, and then start small and approach the open areas or the, the, um, the identify who own that open area and get permit to, to grow food on that piece of land. But the same process of analyzing the soil, analyzing the vegetation that is growing there, assessing how much water you require in the area and uh, how you can bring the water there is very important. Uh, like in the rural area, we first, when we're doing uh, agroecology, it's uh, to look at what resources can you use around the farming, where you do not go and buy uh, synthetic chemicals or fertilizers or any other uh, things that come from outside. What are the resources around? Looking at water, you have gray water from the house. How can you turn this gray water into good water? How can you treat it to make it available for your garden? Uh, looking at uh, the organic matter that is wasted, how can you trap this organic matter and make compost? How can you turn the uh, wood ash into uh, biochar? And how can you take any organic matter into compost? How can you turn, how can you use earthworms to turn organic matter into fertilizer for your garden. So that defines agroecology. And the process of designing is, is the approach of permaculture. So agro, agroecology, it's more of the practice of using the uh, natural resources around you and grow your own food without external inputs. Thank you. So there was a follow-up issue on that, John. Um, uh, Edwin says there's plenty of water available, but the soil is quite clayish. Do you have any advice on that, on clay, clay-like soil? In soil, uh, despite it can be clay, it can be sand, to neutralize soil that are clay is to add organic matter. So if they start by mulching and putting compost, good compost, the soil pH changes and also the soil texture changes because of the organic matter that you are applying in there. But if you use chemical fertilizer, the, the chemical, uh, the, the texture of the soil and also the, text, uh, the fertility of the soil changes and then the soil becomes acidic and then you end up not growing uh, uh, any type of any food because the soils will be not good for crops. But any soil can be changed in its position, its texture by continuous adding organic matter and earthworms into the soil. Thank you for that. Um, there were some other questions that came through. Um, Inchadi Mofokeng asks, uh, thank you for sharing your models. How can we integrate these food pathways in residential settings in a way that enables households to contribute to addressing hunger in the neighborhoods in different ways, gardening, composting, water harvesting, etc." Uh, I mean, I think we've been talking about this all the time, but are there any comments on this? I mean, households are at the front line right now. Uh, John, you have the hub idea, and we also work with the hub concept at WITS and in pathway building. Uh, how are you using the hub to activate or strengthen household production? Uh, Marta, from your side, I mean, uh, in terms of your actual practice, 
how will you be reaching households? I think that's, that's very, very important. And Jane, even yeah. yourself, if you have some ideas, because we have been trying to have knock-on effects in the community with the open training we've been doing. So yeah, all of you, if you can share some thoughts. Yeah, I can start. Uh, how we, we set, uh, usually in a rural area where I work, it's in, you'll find that there are two or three people in a village who are farming and they've been practicing this for many years. So for us, we are, our approach is to go and learn from those farmers and then they share with us. We add our value, our knowledge on that. And then we, we, we work on how that farmer can expand his knowledge to others. And then when others, when he train others, then they will start to realize that they can also do that. They can also grow the food. So they expand and then they form a cop. That cop or cluster, it drives them to go and establish uh, the, the hub. And when the hub is now a center for activity, different activities, it's now looking at what are the important elements or important interventions that are good for the particular community. And we set the demonstrations at the hub so that every farmer who really wants to learn, he can visit the hub and learn or, the, or uh, gain knowledge on anything that he likes on that on that demonstration on the on the hub. The hub is the center of knowledge sharing, and anyone in the community is free to uh, visit and learn whatever technology he likes to apply back at his home state. Thank you, John. Magda, any thoughts about supporting household production with your work? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Rish. I think it, it's very important um, for us um, to get the community involved. But if I can just use the example that we used, because it was very difficult, especially within the Mitchell Spain area, to identify people with backgrounds of growing vegetables. And um, we decided that the only way for us to make contact with the entire Mitchell Spain was to advertise it. And we created a program whereby we would work with them for three months. And after that, people was, um, they could apply. And, um, and then we will form groups and we used to start working in groups and especially identify where this youth within the, uh, the family, you know, try to get as many as of the family involved and make it a family effort. So we would go around, we would have a Beacon Organic Garden, that was a hub where everybody used to meet, and there they could see how we do things. But instead of just leaving them, teaching them um, while they're in the garden, we would go visit every single person that uh, applied to be part of this project. We would go and help them set up their garden. And we would spend three months hands on with them where we make say for instance if we have a group of 20 people we will make sure within that three months we visit every single garden and then we will give them tasks you know and they must report back and at the end of the day um you know um to make them feel it's not just household but also trying to let them understand that you can supply your family with food, but you can also generate the income out of that small little garden that you have. So therefore it's important um, to make contact with your entire community by giving everybody an option. And we thought the only way for us to make contact with everybody was using the local newspaper. And out of that, I mean, for one year we had um, five groups in one year. And we had three um, field workers that worked with them. And for us, it really worked. And every year, you know, now it's about word of mouth. Before we had to advertise it, but now more and people, because now the neighbors see what's going on next door and then they would also approach us. And that is what the networking was growing tremendously because then the schools also come on board because what happened at Beacon School, they also wanted a similar project at their schools. And I think that is how the community has become more and more involved by growing their own ritual because they can now see the benefit um, by doing your own garden at home. 
Thank you, Magda. Jane, so do you I want to talk? I think if you would like to start something within oh. the community, Sorry, it's a bit frozen there. Sorry, Magda, it's frozen. Oh, can't you hear me? Uh, now we can, now we can, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, no, yeah. no, that is all. I, I, I just thought now that this one of the, uh, making use of the local community because, you know, you identify the people that you want to help. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Can, do you want to talk about outreach and impact on households? and how you've been trying to do it. Um, just to add on to what Magda was saying, and based on the WITS experience, um, what we started doing at WITS was set up a forum. So that's, and that's something that we also encourage in the SAFSI is to set up a forum. It could be a food sovereignty forum or a food sovereignty and climate justice forum. And from there decide what you want to do, perhaps start your first garden um, and have little wins and yeah, little goals along the way um, and expand from there. Um, in terms of community outreach from this, um, we have invited people to the training. We've got a WhatsApp group, which is quite active, but not really active in terms of what other people outside WITS are doing. So that is actually something that we need to work on. Um, but to make sure that people who come to the training, we always encourage them to take their lessons, to go back into their communities, to start their, their communal gardens, to start their pavement gardens, or even their household gardens, and then share food and share the skills with their communities. Um, but yeah, that's still something that we need to um, document better. Yeah. So Rhoda Malgas asks a very good question. To what extent are small scale farmers able to mobilize resources laterally? How are farmers managing to sell or barter food, seeds, and other goods and services to one another. This is very, very important. Any thoughts on this? Sharing seeds. So John, in the rural areas, how, how do you maintain seeds and share seeds? And Magda, yourself, also, how do you manage seeds? Any of you? Uh, for, from uh, our program, uh, we are working with um, SKI, Seed Knowledge Initiative. We have a program in our communities where we are encouraging farmers to revive their traditional seeds and the seeds that they see are important in the farming activity. And we are encouraging them to set household seed banks and also communal seed bank or provincial seed banks, where they collect, they grow the plants, select the seeds, process them and store them and redistribute the seeds uh, to other farmers. We also conduct what we call seed fairs in the community where we encourage and bring in, we bring in uh, stakeholders like uh, government departments, um, uh, the councillors to show them that within our local area we have these varieties of seeds that farmers are growing and the, the farmers are still very much interested to grow this type of seed and they are growing them. So that at the end of the day, we are trying to stop external seeds, like uh, GMO seeds, like uh, hybrid seeds. We are trying to say, let's promote our pure breed seeds. And this, they can help us to sustain or to create food sovereignty in our community. Because if you are controlled by uh, uh, seed suppliers, that is a slightly, that's a, a colony on its own. If seed is coming from somewhere, it means you are colonized and you cannot make a choice. So if you own your own seed, you, are, you have the right, you have the choice, you have the voice of what you, you own, it belongs to you. So that's what we encourage more. Thank you. Yes, thank you, comrades. On that, I would like to add um, what we, Part of our program is to teach our um, community how to save seeds. So that uh, because we trained them, we, the plan was to start one seed bank station where everybody will, uh, they, that, that hub will supply everybody. But what's currently happening now in the Western Cape where we share each farmer, each gardener, they would save seeds. 
and then when we get together we would share so that is what we currently do um everybody that's growing vegetables um that has gone through the program know how to save the seeds and when we get together then we just share amongst ourselves so that is what we are currently busy doing here jane do you want to say anything about seeds and sharing or how you how you're doing it at bits Um, yeah, that's also something that we need to improve on. But we have had people visiting the the centre, giving us seeds from around South Africa, even from different parts of the world. Um, and we are we have a, a little informal seed bank that the students are maintaining, and we're trying to save seeds from the crops that we plant. Um, but that's definitely a long term plan to to close that loop, so we don't have to source seeds from from outside, but also so that we can share seeds with those in the community. Okay. Uh, Alice Thompson asks about informal traders who have not been able to sell. This is a very important question. Now they are able to, now they are able to do so with the permit. Have they been able to obtain these permits? Small scale farmers often supply informal traders. So without traders being able to trade, they're not able to sell their produce how are the small-scale farmers coping without being able to sell have you all have you all been able to secure a permit have you all been able to um, sell your produce uh, you started talking about how you couldn't access your produce and so on okay Vish, and you want to say more about this I'm not sure what was the question because you were breaking up now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, just about informal traders and so on. So you all have been able to, over the years, build your capacity to trade as well, if I understand it correctly, including yes. your market in Mitchell's Plain, etc. cetera. Um, so the lockdown has impacted that. Is that correct? Have you all been able to secure a permit or not? Yes. And what's for the, the picture emerging around this? The first two weeks, um, nobody was allowed to trade. Um, but now with the essential document, the permit that we have now, is that we are allowed to sell our, our produce now to the community. As long as we um, have our um, prevention kit and our safety um, is in place. So there are movement on that now whereby the traders are or back on the street selling the vegetables. Okay. As long as you have a permit. If you don't have a permit, then obviously they will lock, lock you up. But we, we try to make sure that most of the trainers um, that are part of our network, that all of them has permits to operate. And was it easy to get the permits? And where did you get the permits from and so on? Okay. It was not easy at first because um, agriculture, we approached them. They were the first people. They agreed that there is permits available, but then they said it was not authorized by head office. So what, what we did, um, this farmers, the market that we have, the Tumzi Community Farmers Market, we used that because that is an NGO and we got the permits through SARS, the essential permits. So um, um, Tumzi, the, our market, they actually made sure that to help our farmers because most of the farmers, they are not registered and we needed a registered company to, to apply for the permits. So we got all our permits through um, Tumzi Community Farmers. Okay. John, anything about permits that you want to share from your experience, particularly for trading and farming and all of that? Uh, no, I do not have much, but what we have done is in Ukuvuna just to encourage farmers to organize themselves so that they apply for permits within their districts and approaching the structures that are there. That's what we, uh, commun how we communicated with farmers through WhatsApp and calling them to follow the existing structure in their own communities. So it's, it's clear that you can unlock, unlock the food commons it might mean then getting organized, self-organizing, jumping these bureaucratic hurdles, uh, putting in applications, getting the permits, 
and then you can continue gardening and maybe you can also do some training. Yesterday, I think it was, um, PLAS had a seminar on, on informal trading. I think it was yesterday, the other day. And I was, I was listening in and it seems the city of Cape Town has only given about 3000 permits to informal traders. So again, I mean, it's a pressure point. Um, CITA, uh, and, and I've been in conversation with the president of CITA, they are trying to have a dialogue with the city of Cape Town about unblocking that as well. Uh, and to create, if you like, um, a separate regime for the informal traders so that they can start moving. So I think all these battles, all of these challenges are still there to unlock the food commons in its totality. There was a important question about fishing and subsistence fishing and whether there's a distinction being made between recreational and subsistence fishing. And this question was asked by Dominic Santos. I think it's a very, very important question, but unfortunately the best person to answer that question because he works with fisher folk uh, and he's been, he's been at the front lines of trying to ensure that they are able to continue their subsistence uh, fishing and so on. That is a big challenge uh, in the current situation. And uh, it's something that we're going to have to confront the state on as well as part of unlocking the food commons. Uh, one of the other uh, comments that was made here was about uh, training and training organizations and training resources. So uh, this question was asked by Rhoda. Let me just say that to all the participants, this is just a kickoff of training around food sovereignty and all its practices, uh, including agroecology, including seed saving, including composting, et cetera, et cetera. So we are going to be running a series of seminars or webinars like this to help people learn the basics of how to set up their gardens and do it themselves. So that's still coming. We have a lot of tools on the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign webpage that people can pull down and start using. But there are other organizations. And so maybe John, Magda, etc. if you all have suggestions about where people can get resources, because I think knowledge is going to be very important. John, where can we get resources? to set up gardens, farming, things like that, training. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, training uh, is something that uh, we, in South Africa, we need to reorganize ourselves well because we do not have colleges of agroecology. We, we are still building up based on the farm experience and also some uh, experts in agroecology. So if uh, anyone needs training, need to approach organizations in the country who are running agroecology systems, so that, uh, yeah, that will help. Within me also the organization I'm a partner with, SKI, we are busy working on a syllabus to start training uh, agroecology online. And uh, also there is uh, in Limpopo, what you call the, Wood spread hub. It's all so it has started training people in agroecology. So including vets, of course, there are some workshops that we are uh, facilitating at vets, uh, and uh, those are the, the key areas that one can uh, equip or learn from. Thank you, Magda. Any suggestions about training resources and stuff like that? Yeah. Um. What I can suggest. Uh, thank you. Um, what I can suggest is that in most cases, it's all about networking and sharing information. So the training that we use, um, especially with the elderly that's been um, in busy with gardening most of the entire life. So all that knowledge we gathered, all that knowledge, and especially with um, the type of soil that we work with and what work and what don't work over the years, as we, um, we were busy farming, we made use of that information and compile it into a tool that we use to, to teach the people um, how to go about things. Because obviously, as you go along, there's always challenges. You know, it might work in Cape Town and it don't work in Joburg. So those are the things when, especially when you make contact with other farmers, even from different provinces, 
and we implement that here in Cape Town and we do research work on that and use that um, as a tool to and create a resource center um, to where people can, um, we can do training with people and then we just work together because I think it's an ongoing learning process that we're going through at the moment now. But that is the type of training, the tools that I'm using here in the Western Cape Town. Jane, maybe you want to just give uh, thumbnails of the SAFC tools that are there. You flashed them in your slide, but just, just tell us very briefly what they're about so people can access them. Sure. So just to reiterate, they're all available on the, the SAFC website, www.safc.org.za. Um, we've got a food sovereignty guide, which is quite an in-depth guide looking at the food system and the food sovereignty alternative. Um, and all of these guides are easy to use and easy to workshop. So there's instructions in the first module on how you can host a workshop and tips for facilitators. So just to mention that. And um, we've also got a guide on seed saving. So how to start your own community or household seed bank. Um, there's a guide on water sovereignty. So how you can go about ensuring water sovereignty in your communities um, in, and in South Africa. Um, we also have a guide on worker cooperatives. And so if you want to set up a worker cooperative, it's also a very in-depth guide on how to go about starting um, and then setting up a worker cooperative. There's a Food Sovereignty Act, which isn't very practical, but that it's very informative as it outlines how the food sovereignty campaigns envisions how it envisions a food sovereign system should look. I mean, all the different elements in that, like land, water, finance, education. Um, and then the last one that we put out is a land, a land, a land guide, looking at how we can use land sustainably, but also looking at the past injustices and how we can promote land justice today. Okay, that's great. Um, there are various people on the chat group who are permaculturalists, agroecologists, and it's really great to have them in the conversation. Uh, they are talking also about resources that can be accessed on WhatsApp groups, Facebook pages. Uh, some are also volunteering to teach. Uh, um, uh, I came across one here. Uh, Mary Howe Watson says, I'm based in Joburg and happy to train anyone that can come visit our community garden in West Dean. I'm also trying to set up more places to train. You're welcome to contact me directly. So Mary, maybe you wanna just punch in your email address or some kind of contact information. Uh, there are others as well on this group. You punch in your contact information so that others can learn from you and we can, can, can build the knowledge commons. There was a question, uh, what is the food commons? I think this is a very, very important question. And, and we can start wrapping up on that note. So the, the commons is basically everything around us. It's all the water resources. It's the land. Uh, it's the biodiversity. It's the biosphere. These are gifts that we have, and they are free. They do not belong to anybody. Okay, We actually live in a planet of abundance. And the idea of commons is for communities to work together to benefit from those commons, to set rules, to set norms, and so on. And so the commons has been there uh, historically for thousands of years. And over the past 500 years, the way we work with the commons has been impacted on by colonialism. It's been impacted on by capitalism. And increasingly, capitalism is taking away the commons. It's commodifying land. It's grabbing land. It's taking away water. It's commodifying water. They even want to commodify the biosphere with carbon trading and so on. So our forests, our biodiversity, they're constantly destroying it and taking it away. The commons is the basis for life. And so in the context of food sovereignty, when we talk about commoning and commons, we are talking about the land um, for farming. That's why community gardening, small scale farming, cooperative farming, all of this is part of the commons. Sharing seeds is part of the commons. Uh, ensuring that knowledge is shared is part of the food commons that we are trying to build. 
retrieving recipes and food culture, which is going extinct, is part of the food commons. So this is, this is a food practice that is not about commodification and making a few people rich where there's winners and losers. It's not about taking away from our ecosystems, but rather putting back into our ecosystems. So that's what the food commons is all about. It's at the heart of food sovereignty. Now, food sovereignty is the idea that comes from La Via Campesina, the largest social movement on planet Earth. It has um, hundreds of millions of, of members. Some say over 300 million members. And the peasantry in the world is still alive and well. We have about 600 million peasants on our own continent. And food sovereignty is about the producer controlling the food system and ultimately the commons, as well as the consumer. So you have culturally appropriate food, healthy food, and, and you are not, if you like, dependent on food corporations, globalized food corporations, fossil fuel food corporations that are not feeding people. Food security is a myth. Food security discourse obscures the fact that millions go to bed hungry, at least 14 million before COVID-19 in South Africa. But yet, food corporations, Agri-SA was saying, we, are, we, are, we produce enough to feed South Africa. There's 50% of food waste in that system, okay? The system uses a lot of water. 62% of our water resources is used by agro-industry in South Africa in a, food, in, 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 in a water-challenged country. So we have a food system that is also promoting unhealthy food choices. Because people have low incomes in households, they're forced to eat cheap, uh, unnutritious food. So the challenge for us is to build a new food system. And that new food system has been in the shadows. It's there. And many of us in the food sovereignty campaign are saying, let's strengthen this. Let's scale this up. And today you got insight into examples of where this is happening. This is the future to, to feed households, to feed communities, to feed villages, towns, and cities. We are going to become a hotter and drier country in the context of climate change and climate science. And I'd like all of you to take this point away. If we do not, we are going to be in a worse situation. And I've said this before, if COVID-19 hit us two years ago at the height of our drought, when staple production was collapsing, when livestock production was collapsing, we would be in a very difficult place as a country. We would have had to import food aid to survive COVID-19 as South Africa. So the message that we'd really like you all to take away is that let's start building food sovereignty pathways wherever we live. Here's a moment. The food crisis has begun. It's visible. It's not new. And it's going to be with us throughout this pandemic. And hopefully, through a food sovereignty response, we can address this challenge. I also want to say that uh, what's come out of the conversation very strongly is that not everybody in the food commons is unlocked. And that's a site of struggle. We have to unlock informal traders. We have to unlock uh, subsistence fishers. We have to unlock more community gardeners, small-scale farmers, etc. And that's that's a crucial political challenge that we will be taking forward. The other point to make in the conversation is that zero hunger starts in your household. And if you start with a household garden, that can immediately push back hunger from your door. Okay. And we are saying there's tools, there's a knowledge commons, and we are sharing it with everybody today. Pull down these tools, contact local farmers, local support organizations. There's hundreds and thousands of them all over to start learning from them. We've put up a tool as well on our Food Sovereignty Campaign webpage to start mapping uh, gardeners, community farmers, uh, et cetera, across the country. So we're making an appeal also for you to log your information there because that's the alternative food map. And through that information, we'll start linking communities with you. We'll start building exchanges between people who are practitioners so that more knowledge can flow. In the next coming weeks, days, and months, we have to make sure that this knowledge is shared with everybody. Finally, I, ju I just want to say that um, we will continue this webinar series, and we hope that you'll join us uh, for the subsequent ones where we'll do more in-depth training. We're busy with a whole set of resources for that. 
But next week, we are having a webinar on unraveling the, or rather unpacking the 500 billion stimulus package. We're going to have three political economists with us. Who are the winners? Who are the losers of the stimulus package? So see you next week and stay safe. Thank you to all our, all our panelists and thank you to all participants. We had over 110 uh, participants in this webinar. Thank you to all of you for participating and for your comments and questions. Stay safe. Thank you, Stan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Stay 